Welcome, everyone. My name is Keith Krulak. I'm the treasurer of USJAA, the United States Japan Exchange and Teaching Alumni Association. Uh, USJAA is a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit organization that was established to support the network of JET alumni and JETAA chapters in the U.S. The mission of USJAA is to provide support and resources to JETAA chapters and individual JET alumni throughout the United States in order to strengthen the capacity of the JETAA network. USJAA supports JETAA chapter leadership with programming, membership recruitment, chapter management, leadership, professional development, and fundraising. Current USJDA programs include, for the current JETS in Japan, a microgrant initiative for American JETS, which is funded by the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. For JETA chapters and leadership here in the United States, a grant program with Sasakawa USA for JETA chapters and subchapters, a mentorship site visit program to support chapter development and best practices, which is generously funded by the Japan Foundation, CGP, and CLAIR. And this year, so far, we visited Boston on February 2nd and Portland on February 28th. And the next up was, is Boulder, Colorado, March 17th and 18th. Lastly is this webinar series, the JEDA Toolbox webinar series, to provide helpful information on chapter leadership to engage all officers of JET alumni chapters, also generously funded by CGP and CLAIR. Today, we're going to be talking about board development and governance with three guest speakers. Mary Jane Atwater, President of Atwater Communications, who is with me here at the U.S. JEDA offices in D.C. Monica Yuki, who among other things is part of the JEDA Board of Directors in New the JEDA New York chapter, and Timothy Roller in Texoma JEDA, the outgoing president there. Please save your questions, uh, if, you're, if you've called in, please save your questions for the end, or feel free to enter them in the chat box in the lower right-hand screen of, of the WebEx dashboard. So without further ado, again, thank you for joining us. And now I would like to pass the mic over for, uh, to Mary Jane for the first um, presentation. Thank you, Mary Jane. Hi, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, just a little bit about myself before we begin. Um, I had the pleasure of helping the original U.S. JEDAA steering committee as they were determining the organization's mission and purpose and vision, and I've also since then helped them at uh, one of their board meetings, just facilitating uh, their meeting. I've served on a number of community boards, and most recently I founded a nonprofit and I chair that board. So uh, board governance and, and creating effective nonprofit boards <clears throat> is something I'm very interested in, and so I'm pleased to share with you today what I know. Um, let's go to our next slide. Oops. Mary Jane, I apologize. I, I forgot to make an important uh, comment okay. that Today, this session will be recorded and uploaded to the U.S. JDAA website. So I just wanted all our participants uh, to know that. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm... <laughs> uh, the space it. is no longer working. The space bar is no longer working. Oops. Okay. I apologize. That's all right. Try this. How about this? Okay. There we go. All right. Thank you, Keith. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today, first of all, is why have a board of directors? I know that some of the chapters do have a board, particularly those who are 501c3s, um, and others may not, but why having a board is a good idea. We'll talk about that. And then about basic board responsibilities. Um, we'll also talk about the role of committees and types of committees. And then there's a, there was a 2015 survey of nonprofit boards, and there was, were some interesting results uh, from that survey that I want to share with you. Okay, so why have a board? Well, the board, as you may guess, is really the governing body of the nonprofit organization. 
it's really the group of people that establish the direction and the structure of the organization, and that's really key. Um, if you have only one or two people uh, without the diverse opinions, the diverse skill sets, um, you don't have the richness of discussions and smart decision making that you might have otherwise. So uh, the board gives you that. Uh, the board is also responsible certainly for all the activities um, of the organization. That could be membership, finance, financial um, affairs, programs, um, and also sustainability, looking forward. Is this organization going to be sustainable over the long term? And, you know, I, I put here required for U.S. JEDA chapters or JEDA chapters, but I believe that is only for those that have a 501c3, and perhaps you can all educate me about that, but um, this, that particular bullet should uh, perhaps be revised, that it's really for 501c3s. Any 501c3 needs to have a board and should have one. Okay, so let's talk about basic board responsibilities. Usually there are nine or ten that most people would agree on. And the first one is determining your mission and your purpose. And you need to know whom do you serve and your goals. Your goals looking forward, your goals short term and long term, and then how will you achieve them. All of those things are really key to um, the mission and the purpose of the organization. And, and the board has oversight all of, over all of that. For or nonprofit organizations, many of them do have a paid executive director, um, but if, if they don't, if it's a nonprofit that's purely volunteer, sometimes there's a coordinator or a program uh, operations manager, the board is responsible for overseeing the selection and then supporting that person as well. And ensuring effective planning, to my mind, that's one of the most important features uh, factors in, in boards, um, and it is really essential um, to have an annual plan, to step back and say, what are we going to be doing this year, and what's that going to lead to beyond that? To have objectives um, and to have specific tasks that you plan to undertake, identify who is responsible for those tasks, and then determine how you're going to evaluate success. So moving on, monitoring and strengthening programs and services, and I know the JET AA chapters do a lot of programs. You always want to make sure that they're consistent with your mission and purpose. I know in organizations that I've been involved in, sometimes somebody will come up with a cool idea for something and say, gee, wouldn't this be great? And we all think, yeah, that's great. But if it's not consistent with your mission and purpose and it's not something you should move forward with, you really shouldn't. It always goes back to what your mission and purpose are. Um, evaluating implementation, and I think that even goes down to your programming, and having surveys or comment cards, evaluating after every program saying, what did we learn here? What's, what went well? What didn't go well? Uh, should we do this again? Um, how can we improve upon it? Ensuring financial, the adequate financial resources, that's really key. Um, Board member giving is, is always an issue. Should board members be required to give? And most of the boards that I've served on or been involved with don't have a specific requirement that somebody give a set amount of money, but there's always an expectation that a board member will participate in the fundraising in, in some way. And sometimes it's a give or get policy. That is, either the board member will give a certain amount of money or they will obtain a certain amount of money from um, their contacts. So uh, board member giving is something certainly to discuss. And of course you want to have a fundraising plan. That should be an annual plan, something that looks ahead. Who are your donors? Who, who are your donor prospects? And how are you going to engage them going forward? Typically, and I have heard this said several times, you should have about seven touch points throughout the year with, with donors. And that could be newsletters that you send out, say, quarterly or um, even monthly, I suppose. But, um, and phone calls you might make just to say to a donor, here's what we're doing. Uh, we're really excited about this program coming up and, you know, invite you to participate. So um, in, in engaging donors is really a key aspect of, board, of board's responsibility. Protecting assets and 
providing financial oversight. I know Tim's going to have some words about that, which are going to be great. Um, but, you, you know, you need to know who has access to your bank account and credit and debit cards. So I won't say more about that because I know Tim's going to cover a good bit of that. Okay, building a competent board, this is always – I think a very interesting proposition, if a board member resigns or you decide you want to expand your board, how do you do it? What do you look for when you're trying to build your board? And I think you want to look for a diversity of skill sets, um, depending on, on your organization, what your mission and purpose is. You know, it might be programming, you need somebody who can work on the website, who has IT background, you need somebody perhaps with marketing communication skills. Uh, you might want to consider somebody with a legal background who can advise um, either on your board or I mean, we'll talk about advisory boards too, but um, all of these kinds of skill sets make up a richness of your board and enable you to make some really smart decisions. And um, one thing I would say about board development or building a board is how important onboarding is, that when you have a new board member coming on, you need to make sure that they fully understand your mission and purpose and how your, your organization works and what their role, their specific role is going to be. Now how about advisory boards? Um, they are a very good idea, and I would think that um, for many Jet AA chapters, bringing in JETs who finished um, had the JET experience a number of years ago, people with Japan experience, people who can advise you on what you're doing, they are a great idea. But you always need to involve them and outline your role for them. Um, make sure that you give them something specific to do. Ensuring legal and ethical integrity, key here. And again, um, Tim is going to touch on that as well, but that's a basic board responsibility to make sure that you're complying with all legal requirements and ethical requirements as well. And to enhance the organization's public standing is a final um, responsibility. And there, I think, um, that's my area actually in communications and in PR. And it's important to garner support from the community and how you do that has got to fall with board oversight. You may have a committee that does that, but you want your board to be very involved in enhancing the organization's public standing and communicating with the public, articulating your mission, letting people know what you do. Okay, and we'll talk next about committees and why have committees. Most boards do have committees. And it, I think the, the role of the committee and, and the role of the committee needs to be uh, very um, well defined so that the committee members know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. But this expedites and divides the work of the board and you can use the specific talents of your membership as well as your board members on these committees. I also think that committees are an important pipeline to board leadership so if you involve people in your committees who um, have leadership potential, you bring them up through through the committee and they can help you, you establish sustainability of leadership over the long term. And of course, the committee's report to the board, um, that's, that's usually a, um, a key element there. I mentioned defining the committee's role, size, leadership, there should be a document that does that. And in the boards that I've served on or have been involved with, at least one board member has served on that committee, and the board member might be the chair of the committee or not. You can set that up the way you want, but you definitely want to include other volunteers um, and decide in, in your document who appoints the chair of the, of the committee and what their term is, who the members are, and so on. Types of committees, of course, there's an executive committee comprised board officers and then standing committee chairs and, and there's latitude in, in what your standing committees are. Your bylaws may require them um, or specify what they would be or their board, your bylaws might also say as the board determines. So, uh, you, you know, you go along with what your, your bylaws say but typically there would be a, a donor development or finance committee, programming committee, membership, fundraising, marketing, publicity. And I always think governance and board development is one that 
um, is important and is often left off because you need to ensure that your organization is, is sustainable. And then, of course, there are ad hoc committees, and those would be for specific events or programs that you have. So in 2015, there was a survey of nonprofit boards, and I thought the results here were pretty interesting, and so I want to conclude by sharing them with you. Um, the first one, the first bullet, that too many directors lack a deep understanding of the organization. Um, and the second one, the lack of engagement among the board members. They don't understand their obligations. That's really surprising to me. Um, and I think you can get around that or, or tackle that problem if you have a really good selection process and onboarding process for your new board members. Provide them with bylaws, that your bylaws, minutes of your past meetings so that they know. Sit down with them and explain exactly what your organization is doing. Do you have a work plan for the coming year? Make sure they understand all of the aspects of what you're doing. The second bullet there, or third, excuse me, the third one, most nonprofits lack formal governance structure and processes. Um, the lack of a succession plan. And, in the research, it was for the executive director, but I also think that pertains to the board itself. If you have a, um, a president or a board chair um, who's very strong, but you don't have anybody strong coming up from behind, that lack of succession can really doom your organization. So you need to make sure that um, you're thinking about that as you go along and as you bring people up into the organization, into leadership roles a lack of audits, board self-evaluation. It's always good for the board to stand back and, and say, hey, what are we doing right? What, what do we need to improve upon? And then I love, or I don't love, but I think this last one is very interesting, that fundraising is seen as a central obligation relative to other duties. That can be dangerous. Um, Yes, fundraising is important. Uh, the nonprofit can't be sustainable unless there is adequate funding. But at the same time, if you're just focused on fundraising uh, to the detriment of your other activities, that can be a dangerous sign. So um, th there are some additional bullets there that um, talk about board donations and that kind of thing. And um, it's interesting that less than half of the board's in the survey that were surveyed have a give or get policy. So uh, fundraising is important, but it, it, it goes along with everything else that the board does and all the other responsibilities that the board members have to ensure the success of the organization. Now the final slide here is just some resources that hopefully would be helpful if you want to delve into the um, nitty gritty of, of board development and look at why Boards fail. There's some research out there about that. Um, there's there are a number of papers. Um, Board Effect is a good website. BridgeSpan. Um, those, those websites have some good resources. You can download white papers on various aspects of board governance. So that's it. So now I will turn it over to <laughs> okay to Monica, and she's going to provide a case study. Actually, you'll turn it back over to me as I... Oh, sorry. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I will uh, pass the baton to Monica. Again, uh, everyone, please, um, if you have questions, save them for the end, and we'll, um, we can do that uh, um, over the phone. Or, by all means, please uh, type in the chat on your lower right-hand side. And again, uh, we are recording this for uh, future viewing. And Monica, I'm passing the baton to you, and hopefully you're unmuted. Are you there, Monica? Yes. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you, Keith. Thank you, Mary Jane, so much for all of your information. And I'm happy to see that Jitani has followed a lot of your suggestions and the things that we've already implemented them. But I also see that there's room for us to grow. Uh, Monica, um, I know. Let me interrupt one. Could you please sure. introduce yourself a little bit, and Tim, please do the same as well. Thank you. What did you ask me to do, Keith? Uh, please, please introduce yourself. You're you're a super uh, super powerful in the Jet alumni. Oh. <laughs> um, sure. Thank you. 
Uh, sure. It's, it's a part of my spiel, but um, just to start off, my name is Monica Yuki. I'm currently the chair of the Jatani Board of Directors here in New York. I also am currently a country rep for the past two years and represent the entire United States on the international level along with two other country reps. And I also have a seat on the U.S. JDA Board. Um, and it's been great since I have different touch points with different levels of the organization. Um, What's really great is there's a variety of chapter leaders on the call today, and just looking at it, I can see Mid-South, Alaska, PNW, San Francisco, New York, Texas. It's so awesome to have so many different chapters on this call, because just like when we're all on jet and every situation is different, we run into that same issue here back running our local chapters. So if there's anything that I say on the call today or you've heard on the recording and you want to help implement into your chapter, or if you have suggestions on helping Jatani or another chapter, please reach out, because we all need to work together to support the chapters, especially when members move from chapters to chapters, chapters or grow or get smaller. Uh, we don't want to lose our leaders and we want to maintain all of our institutional knowledge. Um, so again, a quick background just on my JDA journey is that I um, started on the JET alumni arena in 13 years ago in New York. I started as a social chair, then a vice president, then the president for four years, and now a country rep. And I mention this only because it's a good way to build your board by having people who are growing within your chapter and feel like they have a place and ability to contribute. Oh, let's see if I can change the slide here. Okay, so Jatani is a registered nonprofit. Um, we do have a few other chapters I know within the U.S. I know San Francisco, I think D.C. just got theirs, Los Angeles, and I believe there is another chapter. Um, but the information that I'm going to be sharing today is not just for our nonprofit chapters, but for chapters in general. And having a board, uh, we have to have it for legal reasons, but you can have a board, which is just another support level for all of the chapters. So first I just want to explain kind of the guts and the behind the scenes of Jatani. We have uh, four different or five different levels. Uh, we have a board of directors, which is made up of 10 people, which I'll go to about in more detail, followed by the executive board, which is your alumni-facing active group that plans all of the events. Those executives are elected by the board of directors, and they're the president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. They're supported, supported by committee leaders, and those committee leaders are appointed, appointed by the executive board. And they're people like outreach, career development, book club. But beyond that, we have alumni just interested in hosting events. And what's great is just empowering your alumni to start at any level within this tier, whether it's outside in a subchapter or as a volunteer level, and hoping that they feel comfortable with the structure and that they'll work their way through the organization. Um, this structure has really helped us because we host about 40 to 60 events per calendar year, so we need that constant amount of support from our membership. So this is just a quick agenda of what I'm going to be covering today. So just want to start off with the current board. Our 2018 Board of Directors was elected during um, the end of 2017, and they actually went into position January 1st of 2018. We'll have our first official meeting next week, and as Mary Jane mentioned, this is our onboarding meeting. We'll be sending out info packets ahead of time, the bylaws, um, bios on each of the board members, current and present, um, just so everyone gets to know who they're with because every board member it's a two-year term so some people will be exiting as some people will be leaving and this way there's always institutional knowledge being passed to the organization uh, we're made up of nine alumni one community leader a friend of jet which i'll go into later and the jatani president always has a seat on our board um, and that just helps us stay connected to the organization on the day-to-day -day level um, as you can see we have a variety of uh, professional backgrounds and have participated on the JET program for nearly 20 years. Um, these are all according to our bylaws, but we need to have at least four board members, and this can be increased or decreased by the majority vote on a need basis. We encourage you to have a non-JET on board just for perspective and additional expertise, but it's not mandatory. It just helps us keep with connections to the outside community. Um, since we do have a non-JET, of course, we have to have a rule in place so that the person must be 18 years or older. And ideally, we like to have a variety of people on the board with expertises and perspectives in many different professional industries. And as I mentioned, the Jatani president always has a seat on the board because they're our main contact for the day-to-day -day activities and chapter level um, issues, um, events, and everything else that's going on. 
This is how our board is elected. Uh, the way Jitani is set up is that the general membership elects the board of directors. Then the board of directors elects the leadership team and the leadership team elects the committee. Um, this may not be typical compared to other chapters, but we did this in order to reduce the popularity voting and to make sure that uh, we have the best people in place that are running the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. And I'd love to talk to chapters later and understand your structure in voting because I think that plays a big role into who is driving your chapter, who is coming up with those ideas, who is keeping them together, and how it works. And we want to make sure that we're always maintaining an open environment that is not clicky or too focused in one direction, but we're allowing the chapter to grow as a whole. Uh, board members write a platform and they're included in the voting process. We have, we need to have 100 votes in order for a board member to be onboarded and this year we we're actually able to get 200. So at this time when we do the voting, we also collect other information, uh, usually just professional stuff like the professional industry, their collegiate background. Um, and other things, and this is good to have on hand in case we ever need to have guest speakers or connections to a certain industry, we know how to tap back into our alumni. Uh, within the board, we do have positions according to our bylaws, but for the most part, we work like one big unit and brainstorm and guide the organization um, as a whole. Uh, the secretary role on our board uh, is mainly just for saving um, institutional knowledge and any paperwork. We actually have the Jitani executive board's uh, secretary join the meeting also to take notes, and this is just another touch point to the day-to-day -day chapter um, happenings and to allow someone else to be a part of um, the board of directors. Okay. The responsibilities of the board. Being on the board is uh, much less time commitment than the leadership roles because we don't plan events. We are there just to support, advise, assist, take on any of the leadership things um, that help that they need. So beyond guiding, it's just nice to have our board who can play like a double duty and add an extra set of hands whenever's needed. So if for whatever reason a president has to step down and it's too much work for a vice president, the board of directors who have probably already held an executive position within Jitani can step up and help play into one of those roles. Uh, we have four quarterly meetings a year and the board can meet in person or by phone, but everyone on the board is required to attend at least one Jitani event per calendar year, which should be pretty easy since there are so many awesome events throughout the year. Um, the board also assists with community outreach, connections and partnerships, institutional knowledge, and kind of just acts as a sounding board for the leadership team in case they run into any issues, especially legal or financial. So what I want to share now is kind of just an internal document that we have put together thanks to our governance committee and it was created to organize our board and give us direction. We have five tent poles or pillars as you would say that we use to structure our board and at the first meeting we asked board members which pillar resonates the most with them and what they would like to focus on. I find that people are most successful when they use their current skills. Um, instead of assigning them to a role. Like you don't want to take someone who is a creative person and say, you are now in charge of the finance pillar. So we, all, we ask everyone to volunteer within the organization um, and use their skills to strengthen the organization as a whole. So the first pillar is fiduciary responsibilities. The second is membership support. The third pillar is staying connected to Japan through education, awareness, and service. Pillar four is community relationship. And pillar five is institutional growth and stability. So as a board member chooses to be in one or multiple of these, it helps align with how we set our goals. And we've created goals. Um, these can be revised or changed throughout uh, each calendar year, but it's something to give us um, a direction. And this is just an example from a couple of years ago. Um, it's challenging to accomplish things in the two-year terms that we have, but if something as direct as these are, we can pass them on to the next board member to hopefully as a group accomplish these. So the goals we make are short, mid, and long range, and they change over time to reflect the needs of the uh, alumni community while staying true to the mission and core pillars. So we hope to meet one of these goals um, within the correct time frame. Uh, the goals also provide just focus and clarity to the board in a measurable time format, um, and they assist in recruiting new board members. So if we realize we're losing a board member in one of these pillars, we know who we need to be recruiting for to hopefully help something. Maybe it's a community relationship or we need help with more membership support. So we look for alumni to fill these specific um, areas. 
And then finally, just a couple of tips that have been successful for our board here in New York. Um, you all know your chapters best and what you need at the end of the day, but for Jitani, we have this um, board for legal reasons, but also is to have 10 more active alumni to support the organization. It's been talked about a lot and I'm hoping to implement it this year is an advisory group. And this is something I encourage all chapters to do, just as Mary Jane had mentioned. This is not an official board, but it's a group of alumni of past leaders, our active members, that you wanna keep kind of in your inner circle. Um, they're not constantly advising, but they're offering general guidance when asked for. We would reach out to them from time to time with updates on the chapter, not asking them for anything, but more to keep them in the loop. Um, they used to be very dedicated to your chapter and you know, gave up a lot of their time and energy and their passion about the organization. So they may not have the time now to commit to the organization, but you never know what connections they may have or things they can offer your chapter down the road. Um, and that's kind of where I'm leaving off. Um, that's all for me, but if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. I've listed the contact information for the three different tiers that we have, which is uh, myself being on the board, and then our executive level, which is uh, the president and vice president, and then the committee level. And these are all really great people um, to reach out, the executive and, and committee level, because they can talk about their different roles in case this is something that you're interested in implementing into your chapter. Thank you, Monica, that was wonderful. And uh, now I will try to pass the ball over to Tim. Uh, Hold on. All these mouse clicks and unmute Tim. Hi Tim, are you there? I am here, can you hear me? Excellent, uh, please introduce yourself. And again, just a reminder, we are recording this uh, for posterior, uh, posterity. Sure, so uh, <clears throat> my name is Timothy Roller. Uh, you can see on the slide there, there's a little Esquire there. I've only put that on there to let you know that I'm uh, an attorney. Uh, currently, <clears throat> I'm the president of uh, Texoma. Uh, until the end of this presentation, basically, then I hand it over to the lovely uh, Andy Mac, uh, McCarthy. Uh, I was uh, Fukuoka again, 2000, 2003, but I've been the president of Texoma for uh, four years now. Um, and we have gone through some really um, amazing ups and downs. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's kind of amazing to hear something like uh, what happens in, in New York uh, with such a big chapter. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge, um, you know, comparison for me. It's really amazing that they can do all that. I'm, I'm a little bit jealous, but um, so today what I'm going to be talking about is um, security and accountability with funds. Um, I'll also just be talking about governance uh, in general. Uh, I hope this will uh, be uh, informative to you because uh, this is very much something that um, I've experienced and is, is close to my heart. Okay, so here's a totally hypothetical tale. Um, we had a long, hypothetically, a uh, longtime officer in the same position while new officers were being uh, rotated into their positions. Uh, something close to what Monica had mentioned with uh, people not knowing what was going on, what to do in, in those positions. Uh, when new people would come in and they would ask about uh, how things operated, they would never get direct answers. Um, there were a bunch of purchases uh, that were made uh, that were noted down on documentation as being a new MacBook Pro for office use, uh, books to replace those that a local school had lost in a natural disaster, and a uh, jet returnee event. Uh, when I uh, hypothetically was, was able to go through these documents, um, it turned out that the uh, new MacBook Pro was used generally, was never uh, provided, and it was unknown that it was purchased by anybody um, previously. Uh, the books were actually for personal use, and the jet returnee event was actually a birthday party. Um, and uh, had a $200 plus tab uh, with a $60 tip on it. So the reason I bring this up and the reason I start with this is that I, 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 you know, I deal with ethical issues within my 
uh, role as an attorney uh, all the time. And I, a large part of my job as an attorney is setting up the companies and trying to reinforce on people the importance of these things, because it's one thing to see it on a slide, and it's another thing entirely to know that this can happen in real life. These are real things that happen all the time. And particularly in, in chapters where there isn't the kind of broad oversight that you would see in somewhere like New York, it can be really hard to keep track of these things. Um, so how does this come about? Like, what happens with the, the, the ethics of people? Do we just have bad people around that do terrible things? It doesn't actually work like that. Uh, there's, there's sort of a sliding slope to the whole thing. Um, people tend to rationalize their actions in a lot of ways because there's three sides to what's considered the um, ethics triangle, okay? There's the rationalization, which is how they think about what to do. There's the perceived pressure that they have. And then there's their perceived opportunity. And the, the combination of these things is what really um, creates uh, ethical risk. So, you know, one of the ways in which people rationalize their actions, they say things like, oh, everybody's doing it. Um, you, you see that in a lot of big cases involving banks. They say, oh, well, all the other banks are doing this, so we can do it too. Um, they may see, say that, well, I really need this money much more than uh, my chapter does. Uh, my chapter's not doing a lot, so I, I need the money. Um, maybe they think, oh, I'm gonna pay it back. This is just a small amount. Uh, you know, 20 here, 20 there, I, I'll pay it back. You know, it's not going to be a big deal. Um, one argument you may hear in regards to uh, Jet, uh, to uh, Jetta is that uh, we need to spend money or, or lose it. Um, this, this often comes up in governmental situations where you have funds allotted to you, but they only um, are allotted if, if you show a need. And then a final one, which I think is, is pretty prevalent, is, well, I, I work hard for, for what I do, and I deserve a little extra. I deserve more than what I do. And this is really a problem in situations where you have people working for a nonprofit or, and they're not receiving any compensation because they may feel like they deserve compensation. Um, so drive and motivation can be very different. Um, you know, they may say that they want to um, improve relations. They may want to meet the expectations of uh, Japanese people. Um, they want to further their uh, opportunities in the future. These are the things that get them involved, okay? So who are we talking about? I call them uh, OFs, Officers of Access to Funds. So typically this is the treasurer, the, the president, but it also include vice president, secretary, event organizers, or anyone that's receiving chapter funds. So if you have a chair of a uh, Cherry Blossom Viewing Festival, and they uh, receive a certain amount of funds in order to put on uh, the uh, festival, then they may add a little extra in, or maybe they buy some extra things on the side. Um, there's also a, a real issue of something that people really need to be careful of, and this is a big problem in smaller chapters. Uh, this has happened in uh, Texoma and I know um, Heartland and a bunch of other places that have these um, smaller membership drives where you have to have pe people wearing multiple hats. Um, there's a high uh, ability for those people to uh, have access to funds where they're the only oversight on themselves. And that's something that you absolutely 100% want to make sure doesn't exist within your chapter. Okay, so here's some, some warning signs that you may find and absolutely keep an eye out for these when you're, you're talking to people. Um, they may refuse to dis disclose account details. Uh, they may refuse to provide receipts. They may give you vague description of purchases. For instance, they may say supplies, $300. You need to know exactly what it was. Um, you need to be really careful of, and I think that this is something that really affects us as as Jetta, uh, you need to be careful of the kind of senpai kohai relationship where it's, oh, you know, I've been doing this forever. I know how to do it. I know how this works. Just trust me. This is it's just going to be fine. Um, worry about lack of communication. If you ask questions and you get no reply, that's that's a real issue. Um, also, be careful for last minute rushes to complete required paperwork. If you're getting close to a deadline, um, be proactive with the people that are supposed to provide you with documentation uh, regarding uh, those deadlines. Say, hey, we have, we're a month out from this, where are we at on this? Um, if, if things are coming in the day before, that should be a big red flag to you. If they are coming in and it's saying, uh, you know, you need to uh, do this right now, 
it's very, very rare that things actually need to be done right now. So always take the time to look through carefully what you're provided. Um, request for signed documents that only um, provide the signature page. Um, you'll get arguments like, oh, it's like 50 pages, just trust me, just sign this page. I didn't want to scan the whole thing. Um, people can also get offended when you ask questions. So usually if people get defensive, um, that's a good sign that there may be something that they're hiding. So it's really important when you bring people onto your uh, board or your officers group that you explain to them that questions of that nature are not meant to be personal. It's something that everybody has to be able to answer. They need to be able to talk about what they're doing and they, they shouldn't feel uh, personally attacked by, by questions. Um, Another thing they'll do is they'll often undermine other parties that are involved. So they may uh, say, oh yeah, I haven't got this from so-and-so and that's why I'm not doing it, or oh, this person's causing problems for me. Um, in the hypothetical situation that I'm talking about, all of these things occurred. So the, the toolbox for a potential uh, uh, person committing fraudulent action is very large. There are a lot of ways they can go about do, doing things. And there's also just the tiny, tiny uh, changes that they can make. Be, be careful for things like uh, line items that are, are um, flat numbers. Oh, this was three bucks. Oh, this was 250. Typically tax makes that a little bit different. The numbers are off. So, so watch out for those things. Look for recurring costs and things like that. Um, so relations to those. All officers are of the same accountability level, okay? You have the same report, reporting requirements and you must be completely transparent. You've got to make this an across the board thing. So if uh, the treasurer is uh, taking funds out to give them to someone else, that should be communicated to everybody. Um, if, if the president has to go uh, buy something for an event and it wasn't on the, uh, the plan for the event, then that should be communicated to everybody on the board. All of these things should be open, and when they're not open, if they're found, you need to get an explanation why. You need to understand what that, why that transparency, transparency failed and how you're going to fix it. Um, remember, always stay polite and professional when you're discussing funds. Um, this can get really hard when you get to the point where you're like, well, I need this money for this, and I need this money for this. There can be a lot of um, competing uh, uh, goals. So be sure that you you stay polite and you stay professional about it. And remember that the whole point of um, JETA is is to you know expand our community and our outreach and our our growth with the Japanese people in America and introduce America to Japan. It's not about um, being in control of a certain aspect of of the group. Don't don't get into a situation where you have people being um, kind of put out by the, by the whole process. But make sure that you have rules and procedures, always, always have rules and procedures regarding um, writing funds, make sure that they're widely available. Um, for instance, Texoma has just uh, rewritten our, uh, our entire bylaws. Um, I did a, a very long rewrite uh, based on uh, certain activities and I made sure that there was a lot of reporting requirements in it and that everything was very detailed so that new members, when they come in, would be able to understand how things work and why they work that way. Um, I think that's very important because when you're in a, a small organization especially, there can be a real problem with, well, this just seems cumbersome and I don't know why we're doing it. Um, it's, it's important to be able to look at a document and say, this is, this is why we think it's important. These are the reasons, and this is how we are uh, open and available to our own members. Um, so make sure that you feel no officers are singled out uh, because you don't want to be in a situation where somebody feels like they're pressured, as I said earlier, but you also want to make sure that everybody feels the weight of this. You want to make sure that they all understand how important it is uh, to follow these requirements. Okay, so how to deal with concerns. Um, if, if you're worried about something that's going on, um, try to discuss it with them just generally. Um, I don't wanna say casually, but, but you know, kind of talk about it like, hey, I need to get this documentation, I need to get this receipt, or I need to have some proof of this, um, just for our records. Um, make sure you 
tell other officers, especially ones that have access to funds. Um, those are the people that, you know, you need to be able to discuss with and, may, and may, they may have information like, oh, I received that. I got that receipt from this person and so it's fine. You just need to be able to do those things, make sure um, things escalate at the appropriate level. Um, don't approach things combatively um, because, of course, there are misunderstandings, there's mistakes, and people are human. Um, a large part of auditing, um, which is part of what I do, you find that people just make mistakes. There's no ill intent to it. It's just something that happens. So don't come at people saying, you've done this. Um, if you're unable to make progress on a financial concern, do not give up. Uh, contact your country representative. Contact uh, them. You know, they, they have a lot of experience, especially people like Monica, who are working in uh, very large chapters. Um, that have to deal with um, large fund issues and things like that, and also have connections to people that can help you out. Um, and also, I cannot stress enough that the, the people at Claire are extremely helpful in this regard. Um, they are very knowledgeable. You are not the first chapter to experience this. It has happened in the past, um, and there are various ways to deal with it. And they will do everything they can to help you, and it's really really a relief to hear that from people and have them on your side. Okay, so uh, I think that's about it. Uh, if you have any other questions, go ahead and I get, ask for all of us, I guess, at this point. Very good. Thank you, uh, Tim. Thank you, Monica. And thank you, Mary Jane. Um, I see that uh, about half of us are not using the computer. Uh, so you, you weren't able to type in in the chat. So I'm going to open up uh, and unmute everyone. Uh, if you could mute yourself, uh, if you don't have a question, otherwise I'm ready to take any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Mary Jane, for Monica, or for Tim? No, I mean, they were extremely well done presentations. Um, I, I have a question for Monica. Um, Monica, you mentioned that the New York, uh, the Jitani board uh, is a two year term. Is that limited to two years or can that be extended? It can be extended. Uh, the original bylaws, it was two terms of two years each, but we found that we had some really great alumni, uh, Stephen Horowitz, who you don't want to kick off a board. So um, we keep people on as long as they can, but then we also realize that there's a time when people should move on also, and they can get grandfathered in another position. And Stephen Horowitz is a great example of that. He was an amazing honor board of directors, but now he can lead our board of advisors group or something else. And what it does is it frees up uh, positions on the board of directors for new blood, new ideas, and new leadership, but we don't lose the expertise of a board member, so we kind of grandfather them in to the next senpai level. Excellent. Any other questions? This is Megan DeVille. I have a question that somewhat bridges both Monica and Tim, actually. Um, this, the, thank you guys so much for organizing this today. This type of presentation where we're all getting the same information across all the chapters is really helpful, and I like the addition that it's much more flexible than having to go to a national conference for it. One of my questions is, in a situation where you have a small chapter who the membership turns over very quickly, um, passing on knowledge like Tim was just sharing and even just the knowledge of how to manage your, your finances and your GIA is somewhat like playing telephone. <laughs> and then you're not quite sure if the person before you is giving you good information as they got it from the person before them who got it from the person before them. So I, the question is more of a suggestion and a question. Do you think it would be possible for the treasurer position, which should be steady across all chapters, to have something like this uh, once or twice a year where everyone can receive the same message about how to handle funds and these ethical issues that come up as well um, to make sure that every officer has the opportunity to learn it? 
Megan, uh, that is such a great suggestion. And I think we've all thought about implementing these things like getting the secretaries all on a call, getting the treasurers all on a call. The treasurer group actually already has a Facebook group right now. I know it's kind of dormant, and I know secretary group also has a group, but um, I really like that recommendation. And um, in my role in country rep, I'd love to take on that project for you and actually work with you to get some ideas from you on what topics you need. Um, I'm very lucky to be in New York, so I work very closely with Claire and have been around a long time. So I know a lot of the problems and, you know, bring Tim in and anyone who's had an issue kind of like uh, come up with an agenda of what the problems are and then how chapters solve them. Tim gave this presentation at the last NatCon also, and it was so well received. And that's kind of why I think he was asked to do it again uh, on this platform so that it is available for everyone. But I agree there, we should be doing more throughout the year to help chapters on, um, not even case by case, but it's taking a case and making it into a case study and sharing it in a better way. That, that would be great, Monica. It would be just really helpful at, coming from the president's role. Um, even when we're at NatCon, my treasurer goes off to his treasurer classes while I'm generally attending a different class. So trying to get educated and allowing everyone to be educated on what the role of the treasurer is, I think it would just be helpful if the whole board has the opportunity to learn that and to learn it from a single source where all the information is standardized. That's a really, really, really great idea. And I know I've had a couple of um, leaders reach out to me and, you know, remind, thanks for reminding them about this session, but it's hard on a weekday. So we will try to do some of those varied on weekdays or evenings or um, on the weekends to hopefully do that. Some chapters, um, you also mentioned about, you know, officer turnover. Two chapters come to mind who have done a really great job of implementing um, keeping chapter uh, knowledge passed along, and that's Colorado and Minneapolis. They have created, I guess, Google Share files so that when all the information is kind of dumped into one place, so the next officer can just kind of pick it up, see some of the history. Hopefully, they keep it clean, but at least you see some of the history, maybe your past GIA reports that have been turned in um, and any other communication or bank statements, so they're housed in one place, kind of like what uh, Tim was saying of just keeping everything as transparent and public as possible. Um, and maybe I'll reach out to those chapters, and hopefully, they can do case studies to better share um, how they share their information. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. So uh, one thing I'd like to add to that, uh, well, two actually. So part of what we wrote into the new bylaws is a lot of that, um, this is how we do the transfer. Um, we now have set up, we, we actually had it last night. Um, we have a, a, a handover meeting in which the people that are ch changing roles speak to each other while everybody else is in the room kind of in separate groups so that nobody feels like I don't have a place to go to, I don't know who to talk to. Um, all of the email addresses and everything, everything is kept through uh, Google accounts so that, uh, which our webmaster has, has access to as, as well as each officer, so that everything can be, you can look at everything that the previous officer did through a official communication chat, uh, uh, yeah, channels. And we also have a, um, a Slack group where we do a lot of um, just general talking. Um, the only thing we found with Slack is that um, there's a limit on how much it stores but uh, we, we generally try to keep everything on those two channels so it's, it's uh, efficient. Um, one other point on that, when you were talking about um, handover issues, so one of the things that we added um, after the last NatCon um, was the uh, creation of a, an advisory board. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but our advisory board will be made up of uh, former officers, but also people within the Japanese community um, and uh, Japanese uh, relation community uh, within uh, the Texoma area. That way, nobody's going to feel like they don't have a way, well, okay, so now I know what my role is, but who do I talk to? Who are the people I interact with? Um, if, if I'm the president, who do I reach out to to, to get help on these things? So uh, that, that really, um, I think, is going to make a big difference for us uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very good uh, question, Megan. Uh, did, MJ, did you have any? Uh... No, I think they covered it very well. I mean, to the extent that you can use Google, I would think, with, you know, a, a platform where you can share documents and you can house them for everyone to see them, and I think that was suggested. I think that really is great and, and makes that transitioning uh, more effective. So good comments. Yep, very good. Uh, I would also just point out, in, in addition, maybe uh, 
the this kind of webinar series as well can be forwarded, links can be forwarded around in sort of the, your annual push in addition to doing new tailor-made um, standardized uh, um, information uh, for each, each uh, officer training. Are there any other questions? No? Okay, well, I would like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, again, my name is Keith Krulak. I'm the treasurer uh, of USJA. It's been a pleasure to um, be, moderate this session on board development with uh, Mary Jane Atwater, Monica Yuki, and Timothy Roller. And thank you again for joining. Uh, and I think this takes a little while to post on the USJA website, uh, um, and we'll probably put additional information there as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and let me just remind you that we have two additional sessions coming up. Uh, on March 5th, we have strategies for fundraising and grant writing with speakers Laura Lukaszewski, Elizabeth Brailsford, and Mia Fisher. And on March 6th, we have tools and strategies for membership engagement. Uh, speakers include Stephen Horowitz, Christina Omori, and Wesley Julian. Uh, there will be more details available on the usja.org website and our Facebook page. If there are no other comments, I'd like to uh, end this session. Thank you so much. Thank you.